I want to spend a moment on what's happening in America. Prime Minister Modi and American President Joe Biden will be meeting in a bilateral on the 8th of September. This is uh, President Biden's first visit to India. What do you see happen in that meeting coming as it does on the back of Prime Minister Modi's state visit to the U.S.? And also, how do you see the build-up to the U.S. presidential elections shaping up from here? Are we building up to a Biden versus Trump contest? Um, first on the U.S.-India part, look, at this point, you've had really four administrations of the U.S. reach out to India in very significant ways. That, there is a kind of broad strategic decision that the United States has made uh, to get closer to India and to partner with India. Uh, and that is not going to change. Um, you know, that is, a, that is something both parties agree on. There's very little uh, uh, dissent from that policy. Uh, the Biden people have been executing that policy very well. Modi has been very receptive. So I, I, I don't think there's any danger of any diminution of the U.S.-India uh, uh, partnership or ties, however you want to describe it. There is this danger of, ju of just what happens in the U.S. Um, we think about political instability all over the world. Unfortunately, the place we have to think about it these days is in the United States. Um, look, it's a, it, we, we're in a worrying situation because, as you say, the most likely ma matchup is Trump versus Biden again. Trump is just too strong to be denied the nomination. He's, you know, 30, 40 points ahead of any uh, rival. Um, and that means there are one of two possibilities. Uh, either he's going to win, Donald Trump will win the presidency, and that creates its own complications and crises because it really will be a revenge presidency and it will be Trump unleashed in various ways. Um, or he will claim he won the, the election. Uh, and create a huge political and constitutional crisis. I think there's no other alternative. The, the idea that Trump, this time around, when he loses, if he loses, will quietly accept the results when he did the last time around. I think people are hoping for some, you know, for some change in this in this man, which is not likely to happen. So, which is to say, we are we are heading towards a political crisis in America, either in a second Trump presidency, or a highly contested election in which Trump claims that he has uh, he has won and he will have more allies because they got rid of a lot of the state officials who stood up to him the last time around. I mean, I still don't think he'll prevail, but it could be, a, you know, it, buckle your, your seat belts. It could be a hell of a ride. In the midst of all this, right, there's the rising star who's being tracked quite closely in India, Vivek Ramaswamy. He was nowhere, just seen as a talk show talking head. From there, he seems to have uh, made some strides. Is he likely to be Trump's uh, running mate? And what are you making of the young man and his politics? I think he's very bright. He's very smart. He's very shrewd. He's figured out what the the sort of DNA of the of the of the base of the Republican Party is. You know, this very anti-establishment, anti-elitist, uh, highly suspicious view that sees the government as fundamentally corrupt, broken, uh, floats conspiracy, conspiracy theories. Uh, I think this is all highly calculated. This is the, I very much doubt that it comes from core convictions, honestly. Uh, but it's very effective because that is where the Republican Party's base is. Uh, and you can see it in the fact that when it, the, the further he goes down that path, the more traction he gets. His basic problem is that if you believe in all that, Trump is the real thing. You know, everybody else, Vivek included, are just pale, pale, pale carbon copies. So why wouldn't you go for the real thing? Uh, and he has a day, he did, you know, he just doesn't have a good answer for that. My own sense is that he's really biding his time and setting himself up. Uh, as the you know the kind of inheritor of the post-Trump uh, period, I I doubt very much that Trump would choose him as a vice president. I, I may be wrong. I think. Well, why is, is that? Right. Could he be the first Indian American to be president of the United States a few years from now? It's possible. It's certainly possible. The reason I say it's unlikely is if look if I were advising Trump, his biggest problem right now is with women, uh, particularly college-educated women. Uh, I would advise him to choose Nikki Haley as his uh, as his running mate because that helps him 
with that crucial demographic. Remember, the craziness of the American election, Rahul, is the most powerful man in the world is going to be decided not by the American people. Uh, Biden won by 7 million votes the last time. He'll win by 8 and uh, eight or 9 this time because the demographics get worse for the Republicans every four years. It's going to be decided in four states. Uh, Arizona, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Georgia. And in those four states, take Georgia, for example, Atlanta is going to vote blue. The rural areas are going to vote red. That is, the Atlanta will vote for Biden. The rural areas will vote for Trump. The small number of maybe 10 counties are, that are the, what we call the exurbs, you know, one, one level further than the suburbs uh, of, of Atlanta will probably be the deciding factor. And within those exurbs, it will be working women who will probably be the deciding factor. Because everybody else has decided what they're going to do. So you know, but the thing about that, that is, important. you're saying if Trump were to take your advice, if only he were taking advice from smart, intelligent people, maybe he wouldn't be doing a lot of what he's doing, but that's another story <laughs> altogether. Yeah, so look, all I'm telling you is the rational thing for him to do is to try to affect that small number of working women in those, in those exurbs, in the four states that matter. Um, and Vivek doesn't get him anything with those, uh, whereas Nikki Haley does. She's southern, you know, so she can have an effect in Georgia, um, you know, the, a, a lot of these people are, in a way, they like Southern politicians. Um, Vivek is a, I, I mean, Vivek has managed to do something that uh, that Trump himself has been able to do. A multimillionaire you know, entrepreneur who is, you know, about, as part of the elite as anybody. I mean, the guy went to Harvard, he was, you know, venture capital, biotech. These are not exactly, you know, rural industries. Uh, has managed to present himself as a tribune of the white working class, uh, which is, you know, partly Trump's uh, genius. Uh, how did this billionaire real estate developer get to do that? So the, the, the two tribunes of the white working class in America, both are, in one case, uh, you know, a billionaire, in another case, uh, you know, is worth almost a billion dollars. It's very strange. And both make for good copy. Fareed, I started by asking you about G20, and I want to end this interaction by going back to the big G20 summit. When we asked the Prime Minister about the Russia-Ukraine uh, conflict in that Business Today interview, he sought to make the point that that's not the only issue in the world. There is so much more. The G20 was set up as an economic forum to deal with the financial crisis, to deal with uh, issues of uh, the Global South, he says, uh, reforming multilateral development banks, sustainable development goals, and therefore it can't come down to just what's happening between Russia and Ukraine. We've seen now, though, uh, the German G20 Sherpa and many others uh, in other countries might be thinking along similar lines, saying you can't have a G20 summit and not focus on Russia, Ukraine, which really is the biggest issue at this moment. How do you see this play out? between India wanting to steer the conversation towards economic issues and countries like Germany and others, which are most directly impacted by the Russia-Ukraine war, wanting Russia-Ukraine to be central to the discussions, given that there cannot be any agreement on the language of a communique if it has too much of Russia-Ukraine in it. This gets back to the issue we were talking about, you know, which is India wanting to, on the one hand, be a global leader, but on the other hand, wanting to sort of fudge some of these issues that are about uh, values, norms, rules. Uh, I don't see how you can you can be a leader if you're not willing to push in, in a certain direction. In, you know, we have a vision for the world, not just nakedly pursue your self-interest. If, if India just wants to nakedly pursue its self-interest, fine, but other countries are going to say, why do we have to follow you? And I think that there's this is the, the Russia-Ukraine issue is the elephant in the room right now. You can talk about reforming, you know, the, the trade rules and WTO and uh, you know, UNESCO and UNICEF. But right now what the world is confronting is the most blatant example of cross-border aggression since World War II. It is the largest land war in Europe since World War II. Uh, the, you know, the, the borders have not changed by force very much since 1945. That rule, that norm has been upheld remarkably well in the world. And so this represents a, a, a massive violation of the basic ordering of the world since 1945. You know, does India really want to, to fudge the issue, to not deal with it, to avoid it? Um, and I think that there's a way to, you know, that, that was done in the last G20 of having a communicate that 
in some ways reflects this concern, uh, but doesn't, you know, doesn't get paralyzed by it. That's, that's what effective diplomacy comes to. And it's not just a German issue, uh, Rahul. That, that is, I, I would recommend to you and to Prime Minister Modi and to your viewers the, the speech that the Kenyan uh, representative to the United Nations made after the Russian invasion in explaining why Kenya voted to condemn it. He said, look at us, all of our, our, us developing countries. We all have inherited borders we don't agree with. These were colonial borders. These were borders drawn by people who had no knowledge of, of our countries. And they cut through tribes and religions and linguistic groups. But we have all come to the view that we are not going to try to forcibly alter these, these lines in the, in, the, in the ground. We're going to live with them. We're going to have amicable relations with our neighbors. We're going to try to sort through whatever issues that come up by... That. If, and the reason is, if we were to try to un undo these, you would have, you know, dozens of wars all over the world. And that's that sense that really in international order rests on the idea that you cannot in, in, in 2023 uh, view the world as, as one where the, the strong do what they can and the weak suffer what they must. Uh, Thucydides' is famous line. It has to be a world with a greater sense of purpose, of vision, of values. And that's, that, that's always been India's DNA. Uh, it's always been India's, uh, one of India's superpowers is that it's not just another country. It is the world's greatest experiment in multicultural uh, uh, democracy and, and has managed to do it in conditions of extreme poverty, which almost no country in the world was able to do. And it's managed to do it for 75 years. Uh, so, I mean, I think it's, it's worth keeping in mind what the potential India has to offer in this kind of a world. I hope you've been tracking uh, the Chandrayaan mission to the moon. Lots of enthusiasm here, Farid, in India about being the fourth country to land, uh, soft landing on the moon and also the first to do so on the south pole of the moon. Oh, it's amazing. And what's, what's most amazing about it is uh, the, the cost at which it was done. I mean, this is where, the, you know, when you think about Indian innovation, if you look at the budgets of the four countries that have, that have managed to do it, India is in an order of magnitude lower and, and was able to do a perfect landing and was able to learn from the mistakes of, of Chandrayaan 2. So there, I think, is exactly where the, the, the ingenuity uh, of Indians, and we know this, you know, if you, you look at how Indians are, I remember when I was growing up in India, when, when, when uh, you know, car, the car broke or a TV broke or something, you, you'd ask some Indian repair, and they would come up with some crazy way, you know, it's using you know, for, for 50 rupees of wiring it and making it all work. Um, and that's, that spirit is very present in Chandrayaan, I think. That's the power of Jugaad. Uh, Farid Zakaria, it's been an absolute pleasure. There are no easy answers to any of the questions that are thrown at you. You've done as only you can, shed light on these hot button global issues, you know, sharing your time and insights with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us in India. Always a pleasure, Rahul. Always a pleasure.